Since the dawn of recorded time, the molecular structure of life first stirred in the loins of the primeval swamps. Or to put it another way, ever since Crossroads started. <laughs> man has been aware of a threat to his security. He's been acutely conscious of a brooding presence which menaces his entire existence on this planet. A flickering shadow of evil that blights his struggle for the fulfilment of happiness. No, I'm not talking about the wife's mother. <laughs> you see, tonight we talk about matters even nastier than that knee-length naked Mussolini. <laughs> because tonight we talk about them. The faceless ones. Who are out to destroy us all with their malignant plans and policies. Them. But don't panic, fellow Britons. Stay calm. Because at last, somebody cares about your welfare and what they're doing to your way of life. Dawson is watching. Good evening. This is Dawson Control. It's from here, with the aid of this apparatus that we got from Cat Weasel, that we will be watching them. Just who are these enemies of mankind, you may ask yourself. Well, let's meet a representative of one of the dark forces aligned against us. Looks pretty harmless, doesn't it? An ordinary example of a male Caucasian urban dweller. He even acts like one. He gets his son's homework wrong. <laughs> he likes a pint with the lads. His wife develops migraine and backache when he feels frisky. <laughs> he forgets birthdays and anniversaries. He cheats at golf and would cheerfully throttle a traffic warden with a VAT form. <laughs> On the surface, he appears to be the average man in the street. Harassed, but he isn't. Because, ladies and gentlemen, he is an alien. <laughs> One of the worst kind. Dedicated to bringing you to your knees. You see, he is an estate agent. <laughs> I thought that would chill your blood. <laughs> An estate agent is somebody with the sort of imagination that hovers somewhere between Jules Verne and Crippen. <laughs> and he has a heart that's so cold it runs an antifreeze. He plays an important role in this indictment. Because tonight, the subject is houses. Now, most of us yearn for a house of our own. A material dream to cherish, to build on. A nest in which to raise the fledglings of the future family dynasty. A sanctuary against a quite often hostile world. It seems a simple desire, doesn't it? But getting it is quite a different matter. In fact, it's about as easy as a tailor trying to measure Mangus Pike for a suit. <laughs> When you first get married, well-meaning friends and relatives say to you, put your money in bricks and mortar, lad. Invest in property. It's a fine philosophy in theory, but supposing you're skint. Can you imagine trying to pay your rates with a brick? <laughs> or paying your final demand on the gas bill with two slates and a downspout? Nowhere. Just as a matter of interest, how many people in the audience own their own house? Whereabouts do you live? <laughs> Weybridge. That's where they take fish and chips up in a briefcase. <laughs> Two. When they win at bingo there, they don't shout out. They stand up, wave the gloves and say, Mason, yet. <laughs> it's the only place I know where they get red cabbage through into Florida. <laughs> Who's thinking of buying a house? Anybody? Whereabouts? What district? Croydon. Oh, I've been there. It was shut. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody in the audience who's just bought a house? Or a gentleman at the back with a glazed expression? 
<laughs> Don't worry, sir. Time is a great healer. Now, I've got news for you. The mortgage rate's just gone up. <laughs> Where the gout is tonight. <laughs> now, the task of the estate agent is to con, precondition and train us into lumbering ourselves with crumbling slums that any self-respecting squatter would queue up to get out of. Now, to buy a house, we need a lot of money, and we have to borrow it. So now we're in the hands of the moneylenders, and they'll take you to the cleaners. From the day I bought my first house, I've been cleaned out more times than a gastric parrot's cage. <laughs> but having a house, of course, is a normal, everyday desire, and a very nice one. It's what we all want, because you can't live with in-laws. You must be on your own. When the wife and I first got married, we lived with the wife's mother. We were there for over five years. And I must say that in all that time, we only fought three times. Morning, noon and night. <laughs> she used to prowl around the house like a sort of bronchial warthog. With a face like a bag of spanners. <laughs> Hell of a size. She didn't have elastic in her drawers, it was swish rail. <laughs> When she crossed her legs, it was like looking at two gammas in a stranglehold. <laughs> she once stood outside the house in just a vest, but like a canvas top tabatoire. She never stopped talking, it was murder, even her gums had jet lag. <laughs> she said, you leave everything alone in this house, it's not your house, you're only here on sufferance. <laughs> Don't put the television set on when you feel like it, it's on rental. I'll choose the programmes, it's up to me to put them on. Don't think you can have a bath when you feel like it, because that entails putting on the immersion heater. And that costs a lot of money, so I'll put the immersion heater on. I want two days' notice. And don't think when you come in late, as I know you do frequently, <laughs> you can brew it when you like in the kitchen. Don't use my kettle, it's a Russell, Russell Hobbs from my kettle on. I'll put the kettle on. One night she went to the cinema, I flashed a message on the screen for her to return immediately. She came back and she stood panting in the vestibule like a station horse that's just been reprieved from the knackers. <laughs> She said, what's wrong? I said, nothing, the firewood's broken. <laughs> it wasn't just her, there was the wife's father. Oh, he drank like a demented carp. In fact, he suffered from alcoholic constipation. <laughs> he couldn't pass pubs. <laughs> <laughs> also in that hideous menage, there was the, two, the wife's two eldest sisters. They were a peculiar couple. One was knocked one was bandy. When they stood together in the new, they spelt ops. <laughs> then there was the wife's brother. God knows when he last worked, but he was a sight foreman on Hadrian's wall. <laughs> I said, in all the years you've been at the Labour Exchange, have they ever offered you a job? He said, only once. Apart from that, they show me nothing but kindness. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from having to put up with these people, the house was a mess. Very miserable, it was decorated nearly Gestapo. And it was in badly need of repair. In fact, vandals used to break it and decorate it. <laughs> Terribly overcrowded, but if we all breathed in at the same time, the cat suffocated. <laughs> the wife and I had a bedroom, it was so small, when I turned the lights off, I was in bed before it was dark. <laughs> in fact, for the finish, I thought sitting down was something rich people did. But at least we had shelter. Because despite the fact that we live in a highly complex and technical civilization, statistics prove that the increase in homeless families is quite alarming. Did you know, for instance, that a lot of people are actually having to live in abandoned cars? And what hurts me so much is that most cars in this country are Japanese, so the chances are that they're paying rates to Datsun. <laughs> We've been assured that there's going to be a change. Well, let's have a look. Morning. Morning. I've uh, had a word with the council about the circumstances under which you live and the fact that your wife is pregnant, and I'm happy to say that we are able to offer you larger accommodation. <laughs> Have you seen enough? What a dreadful state of affairs. But who do you turn to in times of trouble? You can't tell the government to go to hell because they're building it for us. <laughs> Everybody's your own choice. My family, my wife's family, always vote Labour. Well, they have to do, they can't spell Conservative. <laughs> but when it comes to the creature comforts, politicians turn a different cloth. You may have read recently they've just spent £3,000 to install a new 
toilet in the House of Commons. Personally, I think it's money well spent. <laughs> it's the only place where they know what they're doing. <laughs> They'll think I want to rise. <laughs> if you can't afford a house of your own, then the next thing you do is you look for a council house. And to get a council house, you have to go through a very bizarre sort of tradition, a ritual which is called putting your name down on the housing list. <laughs> Our hidden cameras were there recently to peep on a couple who were trying to get one. I'm getting married soon, you see, and, and I wondered what the chances were of uh, getting a council house. About the same as Cyril Smith being voted Slimmer of the Year. <laughs> Well, I'll put you on our list, but quite frankly, I don't hold out much hope. <laughs> Told you, didn't I? We allocate houses on a strict points basis, you see. Ten points if you're married, five points for each child you have, five points if you're living with your in-laws. Additional points if you're particularly poor, if there's evidence of overcrowding, if the house you're living in happens to be damp. For psychological reasons. Say the conditions that you're living in uh, cause you to be unbalanced or if you're incapacitated in any way, well, and so on and so on. So there you have it. So if you're not a destitute, one-legged maniac with 24 kids, <laughs> living with your mother-in-law and Hull Kingston Rovers in a wet tent, <laughs> forget it. What I think is wrong about this system is it actively encourages to breed like rabbits. There are four ways you can raise the money. You can go through a building society. I tried this, disaster. I said to the manager, how do I stand for a mortgage? He said, you don't, you grovel. <laughs> you can get money through an insurance company. You can borrow off your local council, or you can get it by robbing a bank. And of these, robbing a bank is by far the easiest. You don't believe me, do you? You try it. Getting money out of a building society is only slightly easier than trying to win a spot the ball competition at a convention of eunuchs. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch this. Yes, well, that takes care of that. Now, about this house you're interested in buying, Mr. Evans, how much money do you think you'll be able to lend the Dulwich? I, I thought the idea was that you lent me the money. Well, yes, yes, it is. But you've got to lend it to us first, of course. Oh. You see, it works like this. Now, you deposit, say, uh, £10 a week with the Dulwich, and on this we give you a very generous rate of interest, uh, 5%, and then when you've saved enough for a deposit, we lend it back to you for a piffling 15%. 10% more? Uh, yes, you could put it like that, yes. So what you're saying is that for every £10 I lend you, you're going to lend me nine. Oh, it's not quite as simple as that, old chap. No? <laughs> no, no, what is simple, though, is for you to give me a pound every week. Oh. <laughs> All right. Here you are, then. Cheers, cheers. Nice doing business with you. See you next week. Oh, yes. <laughs> now we understand money. Now let's try to understand estate agents. Now estate agents are not strangers to the truth. No way. They're liars. <laughs> when they say that a house is pebble dashed, what they really mean is that all the big tracks have been bunged up. <laughs> Here's an example. Let's have a look at some of their little imaginative flights. Wonderful. Here's one. That's what I mean. Cozy, delightful, Swedish-style bungalow. On investigation, that turned out to be a Nissan hut near Biggin Hill. <laughs> Tudor-style house with great charm and small, well-kept gardens. That turned out to be a Victorian coroner's office with a plastic wooden beam in the dinette. <laughs> the garden was in a mess. In fact, the grass was so tall, every time a frog jumped, he got a double hernia. <laughs> oh, they were out on one thing. The garden was small. In fact, he treated the roses for green fly and cramp. <laughs> but to help you find your way through the flights of an estate agent's fevered fancy, we've computerised all their favourite phrases. Ideal for conversion. It's falling down. <laughs> Free from dry rot. Full of wet rot. <laughs> Split level. Subsided. <laughs> Very quiet neighbours. Next door to a cemetery. <laughs> Having picked your house and got the mortgage raised, you may think everything is plain sailing from now onwards. <laughs> <laughs> How wrong you would be. You see, before you can move in, the previous owners have got to move out. And so it goes on all along the line. It's like a, like a daisy chain. 
Take the case of John Ramsbottom of 24 The High Street, Mytham Road. Here he is on the map. <laughs> <laughs> recently got promotion and hence has to now work in the firm's head office in Birmingham. So he's got another mortgage and has now agreed to buy Villain, Wood Street, Birmingham from Mr and Mrs Higgins, a lovely couple of Violet and Leonard. <laughs> Here they are. <laughs> now, Mr and Mrs Higgins can't vacate Villain until their new retirement flat on the coast of Filey is vacated <laughs> by the Wetherills. But the Wetherills can't move till their new house in Sutton Coalfield is free from the Johansons, who in turn can't move till the Greens can be displaced from a masonette in Waltham Abbey. <laughs> Isn't this a fun-filled government? But they're sitting <laughs> waiting for Miss Lena Gell to move out of her terrace in Crystal Palace. But she can't move till the bigger staff's moved out of number 10, Mount Nesting Road in Dive. <laughs> Plums are cheap, who can't move <laughs> until the Pattersons are shifted from Cardiff. But the Pattersons are waiting for the Hendersons to leave Glasgow. And the poor Hendersons are lo longing for the Hughes to move from Cockermouth. But the Hughes can't move because Mr and Mrs Brian Ford of Wigan, Lancashire are still at 18 Canal Street. So all these people up and down the country are being blocked by Brian Field of Wigan. Who is this monster? Who is this Brian Field? Who has brought so much misery to so many people? Brian Field of Wigan is waiting for Ramsbottoms and Matheroyd to move out. <laughs> Stalemate. The chain has now formed a complete circle and is now an unbreakable hoop of steel. And it would have stayed that way because, but luckily, every chain has a weak link. And happily for everybody, Lennon Violet passed away. <laughs> and so the way was clear for every one of those poor innocents to meet yet another of them. Yes, my friends, a bland, pinstripe suited legal piranha fish <laughs> who will strip your wallet to the bone in seconds, the solicitor. Come in. <laughs> <laughs> right, sit down. Ah, can I help you? I hope so. You see, I'm in the process of buying a house. No, 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 not so fast. A mess wage. A what? A mess wage. I'll explain it to you in very simple terms that even a layman like you can understand. <laughs> a mess wage is a term for a house and its surrounding property. Oh. Mess wage. Now repeat after me. <laughs> mess wage. He came in the door a man, and already he's a candidate for being potty trained. <laughs> Of course, it's in the legal profession's interest to make the law as complex and as boring as possible. And that way, none of us feel encouraged to try and understand it. Have you ever read any law books? It's like looking through a copy of Fanny Hill in Yiddish. <laughs> but how is our subject doing? Not very well. He's just been told how long it will take. And now he's just been told how much it will cost. How much? Conveyancing is a very complicated process. Oh, Pickfords are doing the conveyancing. <laughs> oh, never mind. I know. Perhaps I could do it myself. Are you some sort of troublemaker? Or an anarchist, perhaps? Or a witch reporter? I, I only wondered if no, I could No, you could not do it yourself. Why not? You're not clever enough, that's why, though. <laughs> only clever people could do conveyancing. You have to take an abstract of title, then make a search of the land register going back 15 years to check for any encumbrances, and before negotiating the exchange of contracts, and securing completion of the mess wage. You understand all that? Well, nearly. I bet you don't know what the 1925 Sale of Land Act says, or the Lord of Property 1964, or the result of Smith versus Mansai, or Harris v. Batty. Well, I could look them up. What's an ultra-vires rule, or a quasi-easement, or a curtilage? No, it's not a lump of gristle in the middle of your knee. <laughs> Do you know what a remainder man is, or a testator, or an escrow? No. Well, there you are, you see. How on earth can you do your own conveyancing if you don't know what an escrow is? I suppose you're right. What is an escrow? <laughs> well, it's, uh, very difficult to explain. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't want to waste my time and, uh, your money, do we? What a liar. Do you know what his motto is? 
Don't put off tomorrow what you can do next year. But at least the client has the consolation to know that by the time he gets his own new house, it'll probably be a building of historical interest. <laughs> Hang on, here's another one. Uh, sit down. Ah, now let's see, it's 16 Acacia Avenue, isn't it? Yeah, so we searched through the records and, uh, well, what is it? What did you find? Well, it's all to do with King Harold, I'm afraid. Oh. You see, an ancient statue gives anyone of Saxon ancestry a right of way across your land. Eh? So almost anybody in this country can drive a herd of cattle right across your garden. Oh, great. Well, what do I do then? Well, if that should happen, sir, I suggest you give us a ring. Give him a ring? That's a gag. That'll put another quid on the bill. You are not allowed to sell the house to a person with more than two Fs in their name, nor sell oranges on a Sunday. And if a traveller knocks on your door, you must give him a glass of mead. Bloody hell. <laughs> well, let's not disguise the fact that sometimes it does happen that contracts do get exchanged in some of legal Chuck Point Charlie. And then you've got your little dream house. It's only just begun, the nightmare. Though the house doesn't fall down immediately, of course, the surveyors jack the foundations up. <laughs> you've got the neighbours to meet. Thank you. Oh. Oh, it's perfect. Naturally, we'll do a bit of decorating, but it's just right. Four bedrooms, lovely big kitchen. A magnificent garden, and I've got a good workshop. The price is right. Everything's right. And it's ours. Oh. Sometimes I think there must be a catch. What catch can there be? See, they took the shag pile. Mm. <laughs> well, they had a lot of trouble with that cat. They never had it doctored. Yeah. You, you must be the new people. That's right, I'm Colin. And this is Angie. Very <laughs> nice. Well, this is my friend Sissy. And I made it. We your next door neighbours on that side. <laughs> yes. Mine's the garden with the alabaster gnomes and the gnome. ceramic peacock. <laughs> She's got it beautiful, she has, do you really? <laughs> Very nice. It's nice to see somebody in the house after all this time. <laughs> It's years since it happened. What happened? <laughs> My lips are sealed. It took years to get rid of the smell. <laughs> Did they block up the... Uh... <laughs> oh, yes. Immediately after the pest control people left. They never found Mr Clegg, you know. No. But I still swear that there was something struggling in that box that they threw in the culvert. <laughs> well, he was always elusive. I thought it was a lapsed Methodist. <laughs> you know, sometimes, Ada, you're pig ignorant. That's very nice of you to do, people, I must say. Well, you most, I'm sure you'll be very happy here if you're not psychic. <laughs> and if there's anything at all you want, oh, well, just it's... speak up. <laughs> We're always listening. I mean, a <laughs> <laughs> Not like some I could mention. <laughs> that one. Uh, next door, the other side. <laughs> Ten pounds worth of Marks and Spencer's seconds, and she thinks she's Lady Muck. I know for a fact she'd been bringing old Woolworth's lampshades in a Harrods bag. No. Go down on that one. <laughs> and she's not averse to knocking on your door and asking for half a pound to send her pods. She's not very regular. <laughs> Had a lot of trouble, you know, ever since her husband died. Lovely man, a wonderful fellow. Oh. He just sat up in the bed and said, We'll always be sweethearts, and went black. <laughs> well, I was sat there looking after the parrot, you know, I was sat there. I was having a glass of Nest quick and a Devonshire split. Mind you, mind you, she's not as bad as him. Oh. And with that chainsaw. Oh. He's <laughs> always waving it about, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mind you. I think he's I think he's a bit strange. I think he's a bit of it. Yes. I do. <laughs> Since he'd been inside, the scout meetings have dropped off. <laughs> Well, they had to draw a veil over the choir trip, you know. But the cadet never gave evidence against that masked older man, Nacton. No, no. That was one thing about it. <laughs> Mind you, he's had a lot of funny problems, that man. He was never the same after his friend ran away with that woman in from number 32 in the wheelchair. Ah, yeah, it was sad. She's a lovely one, what she made. <laughs> oh, incidentally, be careful what you hang out. What? On the washing line. It's him at number 29. I didn't know it. He hasn't been pinching any of yours, has uh, he? No, he doesn't go in for turquoise. <laughs> <laughs> That's that Latvian emigre, Vic, from number 29. He's the one. Uh, Mind you, I blame his wife for the conditions he's in, you know what I mean? After all, a man's entitled to a little bit of... <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's not had his leg over for years. <laughs> Nothing. Lives like a monk, a trappist. 
<laughs> what makes me sick was when she was younger, she was a mad on that one. Never. Ooh, I could tell you some stories about that. Go on. <laughs> During the war, she had more soldiers than Eisenhower. <laughs> Couldn't get in the bedroom for gum wrappers. <laughs> and I'll tell you something else. She drinks on the quiet. She likes to drink that. She drinks? Ooh, I tell you. She always reckons she's coming back from the bread shop. Have you ever heard bread clink? <laughs> what is it? British sherry. Do you know, there's so many empty bottles in the back garden, it's put 300 pounds... What the have we let ourselves in for? Well, I've always oh, been a bit old in your life. Too late to back out now. You've got a millstone round your neck. They have stuck again. And what about them? The evil forces that got you into this mess in the first place. How do they react? <laughs> <laughs> well, they won't get away with it forever. I'll tell the truth to all the doctors, tradesmen and politicians. You manipulators of mankind, it's your turn next. Because Dawson is watching. And Dawson has his feelers out. <laughs> Life could be hell, good night. <laughs>